Hello, hello. Hi. Welcome to our new webinar series, the Power Series. And thank you all for joining. Um, today we are with uh, our CEO, Diana Verdegnetto. We'll be in conversation with the jewelry designer, Stephen Webster, the founder of the creative agency, Theobald Fox George Smart, and uh -huh. stylist and author, Bay Garnett, to discuss the power of creativity and innovation in challenging times. You can submit questions anytime during the webinar in the Q&A box, and our panelists will answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, everybody, for joining today. Um, I'm very privileged to be here with Steve George and Bay. Um, thank you very much for uh, your time and um, for you know lending us your brain to to kind of uplift um, our day. So. One of my favorite subjects is creativity. This is what we're all here today to talk about. But I guess uh, creativity is one of those things that is really hard to define. So this is a question to the three of you. It's like, how do you define creativity? Because obviously your fields are incredibly different. And maybe we can start with you, Stephen, actually. Okay. Well, um, I think you need to... Um, adds an element of originality to something. You know, it's sort of, so taking something and, and, and you know, feeling that you can take some ownership of it, you know, of, of the way it looks, or maybe it's the way it works, or, the, you know, there's many ways you can apply creativity, but somewhere along the line, you need to add something that's an original sort of view, point of view to it. Um, otherwise, you're not being very creative. So I suppose somewhere along the line, you, you need to, to bring in some originality and um, there's lots of levels of what that can be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Stephen. I think that's so true that it is about, um, a lot of it has to do with originality and kind of not, not following the cr crowd, you know, and, and, and thinking independent, just being very, just thinking independently. I also think it's about kind of being constructive as well. It's, you know, it's piece by piece. You know, there is, I think, real graft in creativity as well. You know, people who produce stuff and, you know, bring original ideas. You know, there's, there's a lot of work that goes behind it too. It has to have sort of some real substance, some sort of real energy and um, hard work behind it too on the whole, I think. George? I, I mean, for fear of being not very creative and agreeing with the other two, um, I, I, I think that there's a lot of truth in all of those things. I think creativity ultimately is kind of like where what is accepted stops and you start to develop your own ideas. And I think that from my point of view, creativity needs to have a value to it. So the value can obviously be economic, but it can also be artistic. It can be um, emotional, it can be cerebral, it can be, um, it, it can be sort of esoteric as well. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately it is about a response and it's about responding to a challenge in a way that hasn't necessarily been an accepted norm before. Mm. So, I mean, right now, it's quite hard to be creative because we have so many challenges around us and it's like, you know, and from one side you feel like, okay, uh, how can I actually draw this, this creative side of me? My South American side talks about or, or things that when you have crisis or a, a, an, a, a, an event that is constraining your creativity is where the time you actually can be more creative. So, where does creativity come from for you, uh, for each one of you, and and uh, and you know, kind of what fuels that creativity? Um, well, uh, if it's my turn again, I can start with you know I've, my day job. You know, my day job is I'm a jeweler, and um, I could be a jeweler that was created by the fact that. A bit like B was saying, you got, um, you know, by the craft, so the skills that, that I'm equipped with, because, you know, I did my training to be a jeweler. So therefore, that's, that's just, you know, creative use of, of, of what I'm, you know, my hands, if you like, and my eye. But I think that I also, you know, so, some time ago now, maybe 25 years ago, started to look at 
uh, the, the sort of what was accepted in jewellery, what was, you know, certainly as a category of fine jewellery, and felt that there was room to apply my creativity to it. Something that felt like I was looking at something like a ring, for example, and, and wanting to make it more relevant to how I felt. And, and you know, you sort of take these things from, from that one point. And, um, you know, before you know it, you're kind of applying it to everything that, that, that I'm touching in a jewellery sense. And, you know, you don't tend to sort of look at something in that creative way and, and then go back again. Um, sometimes it feels like you should because the more creative you are, the more potential you've got for disaster as well. I think that's, that's part of, of, of what creativity is, is taking chances and, and being able to take it on the chin when those, uh, those do turn into failures. Hopefully there's less failures than successes, but, but they are part of the course. Yeah, fair points. And George? I think, I think it's funny, right, listening to Stephen talk there, behind Stephen's David Bowie, and I think music sort of sets the tone for, or it's a good kind of guide for creativity. You don't get any good rock stars when, you know, the world is brilliant. I think that if you were to take music as an example of how, where does creativity comes from, it probably comes from when people are finding life difficult. Um, you know, good music is tends to come from a place where there's no alternative and you're trying to use it as a way out um, of your situation. And I think at the moment, if you look at what's going on in the world right now, collectively as individuals, but also as humanity, we're looking for what our way out is here and what that leadership is. And, you know, creative is just as much about leadership as it is sort of individual response to that as well. So where does creativity come from? I think it comes from whatever situation you're faced with, the best way that you can find to deal with that. So that could be the designing of jewellery. It could be how you develop your business. It could be, you know, how you write, you know, the next David Bowie record that's going to get you out of Brixton and onto the world stage. So each of those different situations, you need to kind of be adaptable to. You know, we're human beings at the end of the day, and it's this, you don't really run life by a rule book, but you do run it in a way that allows you to respond to each of those different situations. Yeah, I mean, Bay, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think that is, you know, really true about some, you know, oftentimes a lot of great work comes out of, you know, times hardship, you know? And I think what's really interesting at the moment is a lot of people I've spoken to, um, finding this time to be it's a kind of I think a, for a real this time is proving to be a time where people are being creative and maybe a more sort of a way for themselves which I think is also really important people are having time to kind of read the books to rethink stuff they're putting their energy and their creativity yeah. into thinking yeah. about into reevaluation, and I think that's really interesting because people finally can actually stop and I mean in a really kind of psychological way as well because the white noise you know has stopped as it were the white noise of competitiveness of all of that stuff to some extent it stopped and I think what's going to come from this is I, I, I don't know um, who knows but I think it's a really interesting time because I think what's happening at the moment is a lot of people are actually stopping and they're finding stuff, whether that's creativity or whatever you want to call it, it's, 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 it's all happening, it, a lot is happening now. I think that's really interesting. When, you, when I speak to people who are always creative, they're always really busy, they're having this real moment of re-evaluation. I, I, I found it really interesting. I think, yeah, yeah. I think that totally. I think stillness is really important. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that, you know, probably at the moment, you know, we could do a lot more. You look, if you look at like what's going on with the government and the small businesses and all the challenges that the business, people's employment, people's livelihoods are kind of being challenged with. Yeah. If the government could just sort of take some leadership and deal with that so we could kind of just focus perhaps on being more still, I think that the economic response as a country would be even more positive because... The best ideas tend to come when you've got that moment of reflection, like you say, Bay. 
And also, and I, to but I also totally agree with you that any kind of reflection, self-reflection, reflection is almost impossible if you're anxious about paying next month's rent. Yeah. So you're right. In order for that, I, I suppose the people I've spoken to maybe do have that freedom. They're also, of course, worried, but they're also surprised by the way in which they're thinking at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I think, you know, when we were, we were discussing yesterday about today's panel, you t um, uh, Diana was talking about, you know, sharing from a creative stand, you know, how people can be more creative who, who don't necessarily think they are creative. And I think that this is where, you know, some of what Bay is saying is that, you know, just people in general have had to be creative, whether they're even recognize it in themselves you know because you, you you've suddenly everything that you're familiar with has been taken away so even even the fact of, of being in a space i i bet there's almost no one out there that's not I've done something with their space that they wouldn't have done had they just been carrying on as normal you know yeah. you can't not you know you've had to make that little place that you normally eat at for example is now perhaps doubles up as your communication area or or, you know, for me is where I'm sort of sitting there doing my work. And, um, and that's already starting to be thinking a little bit out of the box. So it, it's sort of bringing it out of people, whether they, like I say, recognizing themselves yeah. that they're creative or not. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, before jumping to the next uh, question, um, you know, one of the things that are happening in, in, at Post Luxury is when we talk to all the different brands and, and we have global businesses, global brands, is, is like a little bit what you are talking about, is like how everybody has taken a different part of it. Um, and George, in China, um, this idea of stillness uh, comes from Confucius time and says that you can only fish if you stay still, so fish comes to you. So the more you run, the, the more you kind of, the things run away from you. And, when you talk to other other cultures like you know france spain and so on this sense of stillness is something that it has become common ground to absolutely regardless of the nationality or the location everybody talk, talks about that some sense of stillness um now when we talk about when we think about creativity it's not just about what your output is but also how do you choose to live and i was talking to karen my co-founder not that long ago like last week and she said you know now we all know that we can work from home and we can be more efficient um we also kind of exercise or fit around at lunchtime which before we always have something to do and i wonder whether you think that the way that we used to live you know uh before two weeks ago <laughs> It's like a hell of a long time ago. Is, it, is this BC before Corona? Yeah. We're, we're talking about Brexit, Nick. Do you remember that? Yes, I, I do. But I mean, even if it's two weeks ago, the way that we used to live and the way that we're living, and do you think that it will draw any parallels with the way, the way that we will live? Do you think that there is creativity for reinvention in terms of working hours, uh, the way that you trust your teams? Uh, to do what they should be supposed to be doing without having to be in the office 24 7. I think trust has has evolved in a human level uh, right now because you have no choice. I mean, this is what it is. And and I think before perhaps people didn't trust each other that much uh, in, in general. Now you have to, tr like my neighbor upstairs, for example, she trusts me to ha make her job, go and do her shopping for her to eat. And there is nothing I think, I think important. If the question is, I agree with you in terms of trust, I agree with you in terms of stillness. In fact, my, I mean, I always read this book, I don't know if you can see it, but Zen and Japanese, um, and Japanese culture, it's, you know, it's a massive part of what everybody sort of aspires to, but never really practices. We never practice what we preach. I think to, to, you, to answer the question that I think you asked, you know, will whatever is, is going to happen in the future, will that be influenced by this sort of stillness that is happening now? I think that the way that businesses are organized and the way that our sort of our professional, the professional side of our lives, we need to 
challenge those sort of dominant structures that are kind of relics, I guess, of the of um, the industrial revolution and have never really adapted forward. They've been tinkered with with technology, and here we all are now. There are however many people on Facebook, on Zoom, or or watching us for sort of prattle on to each other. Um, but that is potentially a future. But the, the you know people need to then not default back to the same mechanisms of banking, of politics, of, you know, that's the, the organization of power needs to be addressed. And I'm not sort of, well, I am probably calling for a revolution, but at the same time, I think um, if you want to change, you've got to change significantly. If you look at, you know, the pollution rate, but just by not going to work every day, just by not thinking it is absolutely desperately important to get on a plane to go and meet somebody in Germany who, cuts the meeting short by half an hour anyway what difference did that make in the first place it means that we're all probably cleaner and and more sort of like conscious of of the planet that we live on um so we can have you know a more healthy stillness i am um, i okay i i agree with all of that george but i think you and i i'm not so familiar with well a little bit with diana's uh, schedule but we do travel like massively yeah you know you it's very difficult for you to probably do well certainly everything but you know maybe a good percentage of what you do because you you work with hotels in japan i'm just generalizing a bit i know it's more yeah. than that but so do you think you could stay with your feet on the ground and and still sort of progress your business well, I think one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is what does travel mean as a, as a leisure pursuit? You know, we, have, you know, part of our revenue comes from the fact that we promote other places around the world and sell the dream of staying some in a staying and living in a different culture for a period of time to benefit you in in the, the sort of the wholeness that that brings you. Now we face this challenge where nobody is to travel. And you look for that sort of internal gratification that you got from going to another culture. You're now looking to it to like what Bay said, we're revisiting literature. We're looking at, you know, those different creative pursuits that we travel. Do we, will we have to travel as much? There's absolutely no way we will travel to the same extent we have done. No, if we go I, back to this, then we deserve to all fry. It's, it's as simple as that. You know, this is a great opportunity for people to really check themselves, check their business behavior, check their leisure behavior, check their sort of aspiration. If you aspire to basically cruise around the world every day of the week, like some slightly inane influencer desperate to sort of take that photograph of yourself with a different you know, background, and you don't understand what that's doing to everybody else, then you've got to really question why you're here, in my opinion. Well, I mean, it's, in my opinion. it's the million dollar question, isn't it? Like everyone, I feel like, wants it to change. Everyone wants it to change. And then you think, God, but the human beings just slip so quickly back into old habits. But yeah, I mean, I agree. What's really profound, I think, is the Extinction Rebellion and these other, you know, organizations have been calling for this for radical drastic action mm. and i think it's kind of extraordinary that the rock has kind of been pulled from under our feet literally you know in that you know everything has just stopped it is become it's so sort of the way that we're living is so radical you know it's so radical not moving not flying within two weeks ten days and i i think you're right i think things can't go back to normal they just can't because systems have changed and people are just we're re-evaluating so much and I, I i i personally really hope that things can't just go straight back to how they were i really do i really mm. do and i think there is trust i think you're so right about what you said about bosses and employ you know people trust people lots a lot more now i think this has People feel that everyone is working from home. They are doing their bit. They are working really hard. And I think that, that this has really changed that psychologically. We don't all have to be in the same room to prove that we're getting stuff done. I, I, I agree with that. Totally. Yeah. I think I've, I've watched, you know, from, from my, uh, my kitchen table office over here, um, bar and everything, 
that um, and listening to my daughter who I work with, Amy, and um, you know, every day she starts with her laptop um, con con communicating with the team that she works in of basically the marketing and digital uh, side of our business. And um, you know, I can really see over, over the days, they started with a little bit of, right, okay, now this is new, to now this is normal. It's only been like a week. And, and there's a real connection in the team, totally. Mm -hmm. I don't even know yeah. if they would have the same, all sitting in the same room. It's completely I, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, all, all, all of us guys at Theobald Fox, I think that we are more, I mean, it helped that when we, before this, BC, before Corona, um, <laughs> it helped that um, this, that we got on with each other. But now I think that sense of trust was already there. What that has actually manifested itself in is actually probably better work, better use of time. Um, I think that people sort of, you know, people are more aware of what each other is capable of as well. So you, if you're in an office environment, you kind of just wait for somebody to kind of like pick up where you're falling off. Whereas yeah. when you're sort of working in this way and you yeah. perhaps check in digitally at certain times during the day, you're more conscious of making sure that you're dovetailing in the things that you would normally just expect somebody to pick up for you. Yeah, um, I think people are working harder. I think that people yeah. are working, you know, more passionate about their work, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't well, think as well, from our point of view, I don't think, I mean, it's difficult industry by industry. I don't think that's because of the fear of what is going to happen. I think it's actually a really human response yeah. about wanting to work better for each other. That sense exactly. of society is, is really, really strong right now. Yeah, and it's appreciation, isn't it? Yeah, it's like appreciation. Totally. And there's a yeah. sense of accountability, personal accountability, that, for example, where I sit, I have felt, um, I, I look at the work that my team has done in the last only two weeks, and I'm thinking, where were you guys the last couple of years? Uh, in a jokey way, because the sense of accountability, the way that they have catch everything, and it's like, right, let's run. And in a seamless way, is absolutely, um, I could not be more grateful, and also, uh, like, it's not overwhelmed, but it's this kind of joy that gives you, it's like, wow, you know, um, I, I didn't know that you guys were capable of this, but now that I know, it's like, wow, and you feel, you forget you're not their bosses anymore. You are that, that person that is part of that team. And I yeah. think this is, I don't know if I'm alone on this, but um, I think this is something that a lot of the people that I'm, we're talking with, it's, it's, it's bringing people closer together. It's, it's, it's the glue that we need it. Now, I, I totally agree, Diane. I think, I think, the, I think it, we have got to celebrate the fact that we are brilliant human beings. And that, I mean, obviously this talk is about creativity. That creativity that we all are showing collectively. I mean, you asked before, where does creativity come from? I think, you know, creativity ultimately comes from the fact that we're all in this together and we need the best possible way out. Um, and it is so encouraging across the board internationally, wherever you sort of, you know, wherever you're connected to digitally, the response has been pretty much the same. I mean, I think the only people who have not responded in this positive way, are politicians who are still desperate to kind of like use this as some sort of tool for their future. And they're holding back, you know, each, each country, each community's ability to actually probably, well, definitely respond to this in a much more progressive, um, innovative, and creative way. Yeah, no, I agree. I just want to make one quick comment and then jump to the next question. It's like when we talk about extinction rebellion and how we all been campaigning to stop, I think that the other side of this uh, is, you know, the great economic impact. But what I think I really hope that it comes out of this is how, like you said, uh, Bay is about how do we change the system? Because, you know, the way that we were before Corona was not good. Um, and the way that we could be after Corona, uh, it could also be not good because it's likely that countries would go into recession, perhaps depression. So there is definitely a bit in the middle. I mean, the, the pendulum has swing one way and the extreme on the other side 
in less than two weeks. But I do believe that this is a wake up call for everybody to, to really kind of, you know, there is not an either or, there is a middle point in which we desperately need to look at how we can live in fantastic harmony with nature, with each other, and also at the same time, look for what is our economic system built mm -hmm. and how we can actually create businesses, you know, kind of beyond growth. Forget profit, because I think it's profitable is good, but this idea that we have to grow, 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 there is no more room to grow. Yeah, exactly. You know what, that was exactly makes me think of what, what you've just said, makes me think of a just an Instagram post I saw that said that it was Mother Nature is a web telling all of us to go and sit on the naughty step, you know, go back to your rooms. And, you know, you need to just think about everything and you need to reassess and you need to, things need to change. And I totally agree with you where, you know, you thought of at the moment, everything's so tense, these extremes, you know, and I think you're right. I think it's going to be, I really hope that we can all find a way to actually turn it into a system that works with these new changes and the way that these new ways that people are thinking and then these new ways, the way people are working. And I, I wonder how that will be. It's, it's still so new, but I, I'm sorry. Um, she says coughing. Sorry. But um, I think that I, I really hope and I really think that things as will really change they they have to i think <laughs> I, so um i think we have uh kind of uh time for one more question and then we can offer it open it to the audience so if you have not asked your questions please uh type your questions on the q a uh, box underneath um the last question is what is your uh top tip for creativity how do we achieve that moment that creative zone um, Stephen, they have to go for you first. Well, I think it's um, overcoming probably um, a lack of, of confidence, which, which is, is something that we all have. A, you know, I mean, I know people are more confident than others, but I suppose a tip for creativity would be not, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be something that you're immediately go, right, I'm brilliant at that, otherwise I'm not going near it. You know, I'd sort of say, give it a shot, wherever that might fall. You know, I think probably people have discovered that they've got to, they've got to step up a bit when it comes to cooking. Fortunately, 24-7, there's a cookery show on TV in England, which has helped a lot. But I, I know from, um, from myself, when I was isolating on my own a week or so ago, I had to get a bit creative in the kitchen and I knew that I wouldn't be as good as my wife or my daughter or probably anybody, but just by the fact that, you, you know, it was going to be cheese sandwiches every day or, or get stuck in. And I, I think it, it's really a bit of that, that um, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just, just give it a shot. Thank you. George. I, for me, my, what's my top tip for creativity perspective. I think that we all people, you can come at things from so many different points of view and if you're still sort of focused on if you're laser focused on what you're trying to solve there are theoretically 360 different degree points that you can approach that same thing from and each of those gives you a different journey to the same problem somewhere within that if you're not exploring all of those different perspectives you're probably not being creative you're just trying to be sort of process driven um, and get lost along the way. You know, really, you know, it, you don't solve creativity with a schedule. You've got to, you know, that stillness, that freedom of thought, that um, personal challenge, making it difficult for yourself. But perspective for me and, you know, the perspective that you choose to look at a problem with is ultimately the key thing. Thank you. And Bae, last word from you. Uh, last word. In this time, I would say my top tip would be, you know, go easy on yourself and maybe be creative in the sense of poor, get loads of creativity back. You know, read the books that you always wanted to read. You know, read Jane Eyre again. Read, um, oh, The Artist's Way and get inspiration from that. So, I have to say that's kind of what I'm loving doing is just like reading and reading and reading and doing to me, I would say everyone read, but that would be my top tip. And, and I, at the moment, 
um, is to try and maybe or do some drawing, but delve into stuff that you like, like Stephen was saying about cooking. Like just do stuff that you maybe wouldn't have time to do. And it doesn't matter if it's not perfect at all, obviously. <laughs> No, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And um, I don't know if you guys have time to go through the Q&A, so I'm going to read some. And then um, please, whoever choose to, to uh, reply to the questions. But if you guys also can type some of the questions that are directly to you, would be great. Um, Maxine says, uh, what would be the future of luxury, of luxury looks like in light of economic slowdown and CO2 recovery? So what will be the future of luxury or what the, what the future of luxury will look like in the light of economic slowdown and CO2? <coughs> um, shall I answer that one? Yes, please. Okay, I'll start. Um, I think that, that, you know, somewhere along the line, um, luxury had become not quite what, he, what the definition of the word is. You know, it's, it's not so much about you know, just it being super expensive. I think it, it needs to um, say a bit more than that to be a luxury. And, and, and maybe we'll see a bit of return to that, to some, something meaning something, not just I've got a lot of money, therefore I can surround myself in luxury. I, I hope that, that people will be considering more what, what luxury means to, to them. Um, I know you're a great opponent uh, of, um, an advocate of, um, you know, less is more. Um, and that, that sort of maybe sums it up a little bit. Um, what, uh, uh, are we going to see products inspired by coronavirus? Anyone? <laughs> see what? <clears throat> see what? Well see products inspired by coronavirus, Michael asked. I think, um, I mean, I'd, I'd have a go at that. I, I think if you take the restaurant industry, for instance, I think this idea of social distancing at the moment and how you sit as a group in a social situation when you're paying for a meal. My sort of worry at the moment, and it was something we were talking about yesterday, as, as it, within my company was, you know, are people going to want to go and sit next to somebody in a restaurant when you're actually, you know, two foot away from the people next to you, never mind the sort of six foot of social distancing. So will we see products inspired by coronavirus? I, I'm not sure. I mean, Herman's have got their face masks and that kind of thing. But I think you're going to see business models adapt to the sort of cultural change that the, the concept of dealing with um, an, an unseen virus and the impact it has on everybody else has on how they kind of work together. Long serving spoons. Long serving spoons. We're going to need longer serving spoons. Yeah, yeah. Or, or lots of kind of like booths. <laughs> yeah. We're all eating booths. Like you used to do that in Soho, but it wasn't for eating. Um, maybe. <laughs> okay. So uh, moving on. Um, Anthony also asked. Um, maybe people have more energy due to not having to commute. Uh, do you think that uh, commuting is going to be something of the of the past? What do you guys think might happen? I, hope I so. think it, sorry, yeah. yeah. I mean, people are people are reevaluating, even from a financial point of view. People spend a fortune on rent, you know, even just for economic reasons. I'm sure that rent spaces. I'm sure all that will be, you know, looked at again. I mean, don't you guys? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think. think? Yeah. I think the sort of social geography of how, you know, how a country is laid out based on the economic necessity of living close to your work. That now can totally change, and I think it should. It should change. It will take a lot of environmental pressure away. Um, we've built supply chains that are lazy and that are based around, you know, the ease with which it is to get something that you don't necessarily need. Um, yeah. I think that we have got a very perverse sort of transport infrastructure that means, you know, that we've accepted, you know, just horrific conditions in that sense I'm, i mean i'm principally sort of thinking of london and in, in, in with the immediate thoughts but you know the difference that it can make it not being crammed into a tube not being crammed onto a bus and actually sort of being more mindful about how you deal with your work time i don't think that the nine to five will exist necessarily anymore i think people's work will be done on the basis of achieving something rather than just sitting aimlessly at a computer for eight hours a day. 
Totally agree with that. Yeah, and I agree. This, I think that's true, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Bay, but I think this would be fantastic for young women that also have the ambition of being mothers because you can do it all. And, yep. you know, uh, this idea that you can't, it's ridiculous. So I think this probably will open up the opportunity and the possibility to actually dream bigger and not to sacrifice career over motherhood or anything like that. I think this could be, could open a completely different type of, of conversation. Um, a very creative uh, one though, Diana. Yeah. <laughs> Creating different ways. Hello, uh, however, Claudia said, we are speaking about creativity. What about being creative in luxury and beauty industry to fit in the new Corona paradigm? So do we think that there could be um, a new Corona pa paradigm specifically in the luxury and beauty industry? Well, uh, Say that again, Diana, sorry. That products could be done differently or maybe different products that we might need? Not sure. I th look, definitely. I think at the moment, I think that feels like a question that is sort of, I think it's better for everybody to kind of let that simmer and not try to answer those kind of questions now. We should be being still we should be aware of those sort of problems and we'll deal with those as as as, a, as an international society in time i think our focus has got to be on trying to sort of you know look after each other in in this moment of sort of isolation and make sure that we come together from that from that kind of like hopefully from that that embeds that sense of community and that sense of humanity and makes that even stronger that will probably make that kind of question easier to answer in a more purposeful way however for however long down the line it is that we start to get a semblance of whatever our new positive normal can start to look like yeah. um, uh, there's another uh, question thing um I think the work from home situation, Emma says, uh, I think the work from home situation has in some respect leveled the playing field, making it easier for junior workers, diverse workers, women to feel freer to speak up and offer up ideas. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think um, I've witnessed it. Like I say, we're only, we're only two weeks in. I mean, you know, sort of following on a bit from what George was saying, you can't, we can't lay down the foundations right now for everything going forward, but I think certain things you just feel a wave and, and that is one of them. You know, I, I'm seeing that, that people that might be, you know, a little bit just because of junior or whatever, whatever the position may be in, in the office um, are just contributing differently by the way that you, you, we are all doing it now. And I, I think this sort of word, the leveler, is, is, is really, really important. I mean, it's, you know, boy, this has leveled everything. You know, it's some, some, you know, to a certain extent, you could say, okay, the rich don't get as affected as much as, as the poor, but either, this has affected everybody. And, and so, you know, that sort of um, democracy, I think, filters out across the work, workforce. And, um, and so, yes, I can, I can feel that as a, as a way coming on that probably won't sort of just disappear. Yeah, I think that's true. It's exactly like democracy. It's, it's finally, you know, I think that's a good word for it. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, do you think, uh, this is for Eliana, do you think uh, this change will lead to employers and clients valuing creators more? <laughs> good question. Um, Definitely. <laughs> I hope so. I think at the end of the, uh, uh, Jesus, it's hard. What's the answer to that? I, I desperately hope so. I think as an agency, look, our biggest problem with any client is that clients have over the last 10 years definitely become quite averse to risk because of the potential impact it has on their own career. Um, you know, they are less likely to take a chance um, for fear of it doing them some sort of damage. That kind of started after the financial crash. 
So will there be a re-evaluation of the sort of creative relationship between an agency and a client? I hope so. Um, I think that clients and brands um, desperately need to become braver. Um, I think that the creative community from an agency point of view has been incredibly strong and at an international level. I think the client side has, has let creativity down and we often sort of find, you know, decision by committee taking away the sort of the, 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 the essence and, and the beautiful side of creativity, particularly like Bay and Stephen talked about before, those singular thoughts, those things that come from sitting and reading and coming up with a really strong point of view then get sort of dredged in front of 15 marketing managers who are desperate for their sort of like moment of consensus, let's say, that kind of kicks it out of, kicks all the creativity out of it. Do you find that, George, is, is that it is, it's kind of, I would say the middle man, but you know, the sort of whatever that level is that you're talking to prevents that then even getting as far as the consumer. Yes. You know, where, where I've, I certainly see in my industry, you know, there, and, and you know, 2007 was the perfect uh, point where, where that started, where a retail store starts to sort of clamp down. They go, right, what's really safe for us? Right, what's safe is Rolex, Patek, you know, certain brands, because, you know, that, that's safe. And they sort of bunker down on it. And then, you know, before you know it, they, they haven't, they're the same as the next store. They haven't got the, you know, there's no reason why you go in that store. Just the next store's got is Rolex, is Patek. And, and I think, you know, that that's, that's, they're preventing, if you like, the, the consumer, the end consumer, yeah. from even being able to make up their own mind. You know, I, I really feel by the time you get to the individual, they're way more creative in the way they think and the way that they want to surround themselves than, than the level in the middle. Without a doubt, I think, you know, behind you, Bowie, you know, Vivian Westwood, Pam Hogg, all that, those kind of people would just scare the shit out of all of those sort of mid-range marketing type mm. clients who think they're creative, but fundamentally just want consensus. And they want it to look like a version of, like you said, Rolex or Patek or whatever they sort of see as being the key brands that they aspire to be and what you just basically you know, if you mix all the colors in your paint box together or the paints in your box together you get brown um you don't get glorious technicolor you just get a really shitty mess and i think that now is the time where hopefully we we that that, that relationship is reevaluated and go back to what diana said at the start that's about trust you know you, if, if you're the client, your job is to basically look after your brand. It's not necessarily to look after the creativity. Um, you know, if I want you to make me a piece of jewellery, Stephen, I don't sort of turn up and go, can you just do this and can you do that and can you do this? Otherwise, I just make it myself and basically buy your name to stick on it. That relationship, that dynamic has to change. And now, again, like everything else, like travel, like the way that we consume food, like the way that we work, like the, the gender opportunities and the gender equality and all these things that we should be embracing. The creative side of that should be 100%, you know, analysed in terms of, am I the person that should be being involved in the creative process or should, am I the person that should be giving people the freedom to be creative? That being that gatekeeper is just as valuable in the creative process. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been fascinating and I am very grateful uh, to the three of you, George, uh, Stephen and, and Bay, for your time, your creativity, your insights. And, uh, and I leave everybody with, you know, one final thought by Claudia, uh, which I will hand it over now. So uh, I think it's, thank you very much. And I'll see you guys next Thursday from, from us. So over to Claudia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, George. And thank you, Bay, uh, for sharing your knowledge today with us. Thank you all for joining. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Our next webinar will be next Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, with um, three special guests, and we'll be discussing the power of narrative. Please sign up for our newsletter today to receive your special invitation. Stay safe. Thank you all. <laughs>